The dog training industry is, is, is uh, one that has very, very little control. Everybody's a dog trainer and, and uh, I find the more people try to research the topics of dog training, the more confused they become because the neighbor says this, the breeder says this, the vet says this, the book says this, and never the two shall agree. And I, I've kind of boiled it down, there's a couple of different camps. 20, 30, about 30 years ago when I started, it was a two by four approach. It was, that's the only thing people understood. Now the pendulum has, has swung totally the opposite way. Same thing with raising our kids. Nobody wants to say the word no so they don't wreck the child's creative ability. And that same kind of attitude is kind of bled into the, into the, into the, the pet industry. So there is a camp of people out there that only want positive, positive only. And there are still people out there that I think uh, are, are um, not doing dog training justice and are a little bit too, too uh, abusive. And that's not the way we want to train dogs. But... Our approach, I want learn to be fun and motivational. So in the beginning, um, I want the dog to understand things with a lot of motivation, food, toy, whatever we're, we're using, and, and to, to teach the behavior that we want. The next phase is usually a proofing phase. So by our second or third lesson in our classes, we're putting dog food dishes down, we're dropping cookies down, we're bouncing tennis balls around, we're dragging a raccoon tail around. So now, healing is not so simple. And this is an area where I find very few trainers go into proofing. Everything is a lure, a carrot on a stick approach in the positive method. And, and that's great, but you have to evolve into, into the proofing method. And then the third phase that, that I believe in is a securing phase. And all that means is you've done it over and over and over enough times that the dog figures it was his idea in the first place. But in the positive only approach, I, I do like it for many things. But when you're getting into some of the dogs that have a lot of these... Uh, um, strong wills and things like that. Positive training works very well as long as you have what the dog wants. So what I mean by that, if that dog is food motivated and now you having the treats and you're the supplier, you can shape those behaviors into anything you want to get that. And then if you're using marking behaviors and clickers, you could even enhance that even further. They're great tools. But when you get into the environment, if the environment is as satisfying for the dog, then what you're trying to offer, or more satisfying, that's where you get into trouble. So the example is going to be, you're trying to heal your dog, and a cat runs out in front of you, and now that chase game is way more important to the dog than getting that cookie from you. That's where you'll start having problems, and uh, it's very difficult to kind of teach a dog that chasing that cat was wrong when the action itself is so self-fulfilling for the dog. And I think that's the problem that people really have a... a um, a difficulty understanding as long as you have what the dog wants positive is great but when you're getting into situations where, where you know the cat or or the, the dog is getting some kind of fulfillment um, from uh, from the environment like a police dog when the ultimate goal for that police dog is to bite that bad guy giving him a cookie over here is not going to cut it as the same value reward of, of the apprehension it takes and I think that's where where you know, a lot of people have problems in their overall control. Keep it in mind, a dog is a pack animal. They're used to um, taking leadership or signals, a lot of body cues from that, that leader. Um, the old fashioned days where you know, it was more of a force instilled approach, that kind of worked, but they, it worked only because the dog was scared of you, not because it was a very productive way of training. So it's still something that we don't want, but at the end of the day, the dog still has to understand you're the policy maker and they're the policy follower. And in some of the shows that you see on, t on, on TV today, you'll see some shows that are very geared to how, how animals learn and they're, they're talk, they're, they're, they'll refer often to, to, to the opera conditioning, classical conditioning, that's all great. And then you'll, feel, you'll see others that will kind of lean a little bit more to um, you got to be the alpha, you got to be the dominant person, and, and I, I, cert, I believe a certain amount of that, but you have the ability to be fair. I still want my dog to know I'm the policy maker, but I'm, as a, as a father, I'm, I'm hopefully the, the leader in my household, 
but my kids know I'm very fair and I joke around and, and your dogs know the same thing. But at the end of the day, they know when I'm serious and when I'm not. And our animals have to do the same thing. Everything cannot be a negotiation. Everything cannot be a carrot and a stick or a lure, lure. At the end of the day, the dog still has to understand when I say sit, sit means sit. Down means down, stay means stay. Regardless of what the temptation is on the other side. And, and that really is a balance of both systems. So we want the learning to be fun and motivational, but at the end of the day, there has to be some kind of understanding in your proofing method where the dog has to know, boy, if I move, there's a consequence for that. And I think that's a bit more of a balanced approach that a lot of people um, that are entering our industry now um, are, are not very familiar with, with uh, understanding.